Um, just for starting out, I call these presentations unusual canopy emergency procedures because these are unusual situations. These aren't your just your normal look, grab, look, grab, arch, pull, pull, check. These are situations where you're going to have to do a whole bunch of other things, even if you get to pull handles or even if you end up pulling both handles or no handles at all. So these aren't real, real clear for most jumpers. So I'm, I've created this compilation of techniques and options to kind of address these because these are some of the most life-threatening situations a Ram Air parachutist can face. Also, my disclaimer is, hey, these are my best world uh, recommendations um, through a whole bunch of experience and a whole bunch of, of witnessing a lot of accidents and other, other injuries. Um, so everything I'm telling you here is my best way to deal with it. But because no two situations are identical, um, you may do everything right and you could still be killed in one of these situations. All right, so my sources for this information was, one, I pulled up the U.S. Army, did a study on dual deployments back in the early 90s when they added Ram Air Reserve parachutes to the military. That study was extremely detailed, and I got a lot of really great information from it. Then the parachute industry made a, a malfunction video back in the 90s called Breakaway. And it was a bunch of part people in, Flor in Deland, Florida, uh, that worked for most of the manufacturers down there, that went up and they did every malfunction you could come up with, including entanglements and including dual deployments. And they landed them, they did everything. And uh, what was really interesting about that video, it was one of the best videos of all time, but also they did all those jumps without wearing a third parachute. Uh, I'm not quite that brave. Um, and then my witnessing of Ram Air parachute accidents for my whole life. Um, as you'll see in my bio, uh, I've been jumping for 45 years now. I made my first jump in 1978 when I turned 16. I've never been on current, and I got a little over 24,000 jumps now. Um, so I've saw a lot of people get hurt and killed. Um, I've had it personally was in, involved in a entanglement during canopy formation where my reserve got pulled in the entanglement and I ended up having to land a main reserve entanglement. Because of that, I've been doing some form of this brief ever since that day. And that was a long time ago in the 90s. All right, so I put my bio up here. Um, obviously, I've got a lot of stuff for the military. Uh, for the last 23 years, I've been working uh, almost primarily for the military, but also doing a lot of demos and doing some sport jumping as well. Um, so you can see this is most of my military background. Uh, and then slide five, this is most of my USPA background. One of the things you'll notice at, you know, at the bottom of this is that I've been involved in a lot of entanglements. And that was because I was a canopy formation competitor for 20 years. Um, and so a lot of the information that I'm going to present to you, not necessarily, not necessarily for the dual deployments, but for the entanglements came from that. And then the last third, the last page of my bio, this is just all the stuff I did being a young jumper. Uh, both of my parents being professional skydivers owned a drop zone. I started working there when I was 10 as a uh, packer, packing T10s, round parachutes. And then when I turned 16, I started skydiving. Uh, I started hang gliding at 15, flew a, a powered aircraft at 17, or soloed an aircraft at 17. So anyway, that's kind of a little bit about who I am. You can look at all that other stuff if you want more detail. Starting the, the prep here, these subjects are often avoided or minimally addressed because they are rare and because they have infinite variables. The options and correct actions can be complicated and difficult to identify or discuss. A jumper can be paralyzed with too much information. In other words, they can actually do nothing because they're afraid to do the wrong thing. And believe it or not, people have been, jumpers have been killed and did nothing. They just rode whatever situation was to the ground because they were afraid to do the wrong thing and then absolutely, you know, did nothing. Um, and then the last part, very few instructors and jumpers have any personal experience to share. Because these things are rare, most jumpers have never had a dual deployment. If you maintain your equipment well and you pull at the right altitudes, you shouldn't ever have a dual deployment. Uh, right here, I've got a pair of canopies. This is a, uh, a PD-300 main, 9-cell, and a PD-283 
uh, reserve seven cell. I did a whole bunch of jumps in this uh, in this presentation where I flew and landed this can canopy combination. I also did several other combinations that I'll keep I'll show you as we get through them. The smallest one that I that I ended up landing was the one that happened to me years ago, which was a 143 reserve with a 150 main. What causes a dual deployment? In today's world, it's usually the AAD. And normally the AAD, it doesn't know if you pull low. If you go through activation altitude, the reserve's coming out, even if you've already thrown the main. So that's a pretty common one. For our military folk, setting the Cypress too high for the particular altitude that you're going to be pulling the main. This does happen in the military because we can set the Cypress to activate at any altitude, which would be advantageous if we're doing a hey-ho profile where we're going to fly the parachutes from 20,000 feet for a good 15 miles and we have a mountain to go over. So we want that Cypress to be high enough or if we have an area where we're exiting the aircraft that has a higher elevation, we want to make sure the Cypress is set high enough to prevent uh, impact with that elevation. So that's why for the military, an improper setting is also one of the more common causes. The next common cause would be a dislodged reserve ripcord pin due to movement in the aircraft or failure to inspect. For the military, we get lots of inspections, so it's not usually an issue with that. But young jumpers and military jumpers alike have a tendency to flop back on their reserve in the aircraft. Well, every time you lean back on that reserve container, you push the reserve pin just a little bit through the reserve flap. It is possible that leaning back enough times, you could end up pushing that reserve pin to where it's right on the edge of the loop. And as soon as your main starts to open, it pops the reserve as well. This has actually happened to a couple of my friends, so I know it's possible. The next one is something that happens typically um, to an, a young jumper or a new jumper. And that is um, a, a main riser rake of the reserve ripcord pin during an unstable deployment. So if I go out and I leave my hand out here when I reach for the pilot chute, at this moment, I end up on my side. And then I throw the pilot chute. So now the air is going this way. So the riser on the low side has to sweep across the reserve as it's riding me. And so if I'm leaned into it just a little bit, that reserve, that riser can push the reserve pin out through the cover flap. I've actually saw it happen twice in free fall where a student did that. So I know it's a factor. I know it can happen. The more common situation is a pilot chute and tow. So anytime we're towing our main pilot chute and it's not pulling that pin, Either it's malfunction or there's something wrong with the routing or we have something weird going on. So then we go to cut away, pull the reserve. As soon as the reserve container opens, it relieves tension on that main container. And now the reserve starts and right behind it, the main starts coming out. Because that little bit that was holding it, it didn't take as much tension to release it. Because we have share in that common flap. We got reserve container up top main container on the bottom, and that center flap they share. So when I relieve the tension on the top container, I also relieve the tension on the bottom container. I've seen more than 25 times where someone with a pilot chute and tow cut away, pulled the reserve, and ended up with both canopies out. Now, if I've already pulled that cutaway handle, that main should come out and keep going. Hopefully that by it not spending a lot of time up there, it has less time to become entangled. And then the last one that's pretty common, it would be a collision in free fall or during canopy flight. A collision in free fall would be enough to break the closing loops and get canopies to come out. A collision under canopy could be enough. Just the body impact could break a closing loop and get a reserve coming out. Or the lines of the other canopy could go under the reserve flap and actually cut the reserve closing loop. With today's containers, we have pretty good reserve protection that prevents a lot of that, and that line should just go right over the top. But if your tuck tab doesn't tuck very well, and sometimes it's sticking out, that line can come right under there and go right underneath and cut the loop. So those are the ways that are the most common causes of a, a dual deployment in today's skydiving world. 
This first video is me creating a dual deployment. And in this case, I did, I did four of these where I tried to get the main and reserve to come out at the exact same time to see how they would interact. You'll notice on this video, I am wearing a third parachute. I am not completely crazy. Not nearly as much as my wife thinks I am. So, as you watch these canopies come out, I'm trying to get them to come out at the same time. So as you see, the reserve gets a little head start right here, and then there goes the main. And I don't know if it happened so fast, did anybody see the main pass through the lines of the reserve? Let's look at it in slow, slower motion here. So you see, I'm gonna try to get both handles, try to get them both to come out at the same time, so I get, get that reserve ready, here we go. Throw and pull, reserve pilot chute goes, and there goes the main. And can you see the main ended up in front of the reserve? So if we look at these, uh, look at the reverse here, you can see it's pretty ugly. It's something you don't wanna see. <laughs> That's why it's better you don't see it. And then if you look at the pictures here, you can see right there, it's pretty obvious that that main is now on the front side of that reserve. So it's passed from, from the back to the front. Um, also, if you look here, what, look what happens the first one-tenth of a second. Those bridles twist right up. And then here's the reserve going up first, hits the top, starts to spread, then the main follows it, and then right here, the reserve slider starts to inflate, the main pilot chute and bag hits that slider, then it's got to go somewhere. It can either go out the back where it was supposed to go, it can go out the front, as it did in these photos, or it could go out the side, or it could even go through one steering line. But this is the thing that most people don't understand that is so deadly about a dual deployment, is that they end up passing through one another. And it might be difficult to identify that. So right there, very obvious that it's passed through. And then if you look at this last photo, Here's the canopy, it's fallen down now. It's fallen down next to me. So I wouldn't have even known that the main had passed through the lines if I didn't look at the risers. So by looking at the risers, I could see the main risers were going around the reserve risers. However, because it was front to back or back to front in this case, the risers had some place to go. Either this way, this way, this way, or that way. Had it passed through the side, then you would not be able to get rid of the main parachute and you would be forced to land two canopies. Otherwise, it would be fatal. So, after all that happens behind you, you could end up with all of these situations. Both canopies deployed without any form of entanglement. Both canopies deployed with some form of entanglement. One or both canopies inflated and controllable. One or both canopies inflated and uncontrollable. Or you could have neither canopy inflated because they're still in the bag. If they're still in the bag, get one out of the bag now. Now, because it's an infinite number of things that could happen and an infinite uh, number of variables we could be dealing with, I broke it down into four configurations, four basic configurations that they're gonna be in. And that's the four you see here. Side by side, some form of a biplane, the dreaded downplane, or partially deployed, where we have one parachute open and one parachute partially deployed. Common responses for all dual deployments. The number one most important thing if you have two parachutes deployed is to check for entanglement. This is critical. Most jumpers don't do this. So you have to inspect the risers and suspension lines and be 100% certain that no parachute has passed through the lines or risers of the other parachute. This is gonna take a minimum of 20 seconds. For most people, it could take up to a minute especially for the military jumpers who are jumping at night wearing NVGs. you got a lot to look for. Um, so you, in other words, you got to have time to make the inspection before you think about getting rid of the main parachute. One of the things we've got to look for is how are the risers crossing? So you got eight risers, Bob. Eight. I got eight risers I got to report to. All right, I got four going over here. I got four going over here. I might have some crossing right above my head. 
So I need to look at each riser and follow it and see where it goes. Make sure nothing has passed through anything. Make sure all of it makes sense. One of the most important things we're going to be looking for is how the risers are crossing. Especially if we have a canopy on each side, we're going to have risers right over our head right here with some going that way and some going that way. We need to make sure that they haven't passed through one another. All right, so looking at this photo here, we can see we've got the reserve over on the right and we've got the main over on the left. And then we have risers crossing right over your head. And typically, they're right here. You actually got to put your head back a little bit to see them. So that's one of the most critical things that we want to find is how are those risers crossing. As you can see in the picture, they're crossing like this and they're laying against one another. In other words, one parachute is laying against the other parachute. And that's what we want to see. That's a good sign. And if you look at this next picture, you can see, look how close together those risers are. Look how much they're compressed. They're definitely closer together than normal. And that's because normally we have the risers like this, but we have two sets now trying to work in that same space. And because of that, they're compressing against one another. The compressing against one another, like you see there, is definitely the best way. And that tells you that it looks like they're laying against and not passing through. If I see risers passing through risers like that, that would be a situation where I have to land both canopies. And then the last picture here shows that grip on the two canopies on a, on a side by side, which we're going to see a bunch more of the video here in just a second. So as you can see, I'm gripping both of these risers here, as you can see in the, in the photo there. And then you put just a little bit of pressure on them. And the reason for that is we're trying to get the canopy on the right to turn slightly to the left towards the other canopy. Trying to get the canopy on the left to turn slightly to the right. We don't need to remember rights and left. Just push them together. And if you see this, you can see the grip there where I'm putting about two to three inches of pressure on each riser and just holding them so that the canopies stay together. So when we're checking for these risers and we're looking to make sure that they're not passing through one another, any riser passing through any other riser is a reason to land two parachutes. Now, main risers going through reserve risers, if you cut that away, there's a small chance that they may leave and clear, but it's not a chance I would be willing to take because your chances of it snagging and making the reserve uncontrollable are very high. If you have the opposite, if you have reserve risers passing through main risers and you cut away, that's usually fatal because that's going to completely close the reserve 100% and you're going to be left with just one half a riser on one half of a main canopy. So it's extremely important that any risers passing through any other risers, you end up landing both canopies. Now, the other thing we've got to look for in the entanglement is the deployment devices. Obviously, the bag and pilot sheet on the main is going to be up there somewhere. It's going to be attached to the center of the main and hanging back down somewhere. The bag and pilot chute on the reserve is called a free bag because it's not attached to the reserve. This is one of the greatest inventions in skydiving of all time. The free bag has saved thousands of lives because what it allows is if the reserve pilot chute were to snag on something, the bag and the bridle can continue the deployment of the reserve let the reserve go and let the reserve open freely without being interfered by that horseshoe malfunction of the reserve pilot chute. So if you see the free bag up there in those two canopies, it's entangled with something. Otherwise, it's gone floating down all by itself. So what is it tied to? Is it tied to both canopies? Is it tied to just one canopy? That's something you have to check and make sure that the two canopies are not tied together with that free bag. All right. More common responses for all configurations. Number two, do not release the brakes on either canopy if you have not already done so. The reason is we want that canopy to fly slow. 
The brakes are probably still set on the reserve, so it's flying slow. And we want the two canopies to fly at the same speed. We don't want one to go dramatically faster than the other. Plus, it's much easier to manipulate those canopies on rear risers with the brakes set. Everything moves slower. Everything happens slower. It's much easier to control the parachutes. Plus, if we have to land them, you're coming down at half the descent rate, which is very manageable and very doable. So for that reason, we keep those brakes set. Now, what if we open our main low, main comes out, opens up, we release the brakes on the main, and then we realize our Cypress fired and our reserve pilot chute is coming out. Well, at that point, just go to half brakes on the main parachute, maintain half brakes so that you have the same brake setting as the other canopy, which is the reserve, set at half brakes. And then you're going to manipulate the main using a half brake position to match the reserve.